is here. It's very humbling to meet everybody and hear their stories. Uh, I really want to congratulate and thank uh, DJ and Sherry for such a great arrangement. Although I'd like to point out a really horrible flaw that they had in this meeting in that they put me to follow Dr. Scott and Dr. Steiner. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of like Sherry, having, Sherry uh, did that. That was Sherry. You know, it's, like, it's like having you know Hank Aaron and Babe Ruth and then you bring up the backup catcher for the Toledo Monday. <laughs> 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 Um, so, uh, you know, I uh, work at Children's Hospital, and what I thought I, uh, you know, would chat a little bit about today is some of the research we're trying to do at Children's and in collaboration with other people around the, the country and the world. Uh, it is great to come to these meetings and hear all the exciting stuff that's going on at Stanford, all the things that people are talking about what they're doing. And I, and I would comment as a start here, one of the most important things with research, I really think, is you know, you look at what Dr. Scott and Dr. Steinberg have done, they are tremendous surgeons. It's, it, again, to keep the sports analogies, it's like you get Magic Johnson and Larry Bird on the two coasts, you know, and they, they're just superb surgeons. It's going to be very hard to really make a lot of big advances on what they can do operatively. And so as a person who now has sort of been very interested in the field and worked on it for a number of years, as hard as I'm trying to work in the operating room to replicate their success technically, I really think the only way we're going to advance the field substantively to improve on what great stuff they've done is to get in the laboratory and learn things so we can be smarter about how we uh, discover and treat this disease. So I want to talk a little bit about that today. Um, the hard thing about Moya Moya, I think, and we all have talked about what it is, but it's rare, it's recent, and it's diverse. And by that I mean there's not a lot of kids and adults with Moya Moya in the world. There's a huge group here, it's immensely important to everyone in this room, but you go out in the general population, it's hard to find people who know what Moya Moya is, and it's hard to drum up support for research because of that. It's recently diagnosed, I mean, really just in the past 40 years or so that it actually get a name. And so when you talk to the NIH, uh, the National Institutes of Health, when you talk to people about funding, it's hard to get people to get too excited about this as compared to other things like cancer or heart disease and heart attacks. And then, you know, the other thing that's, that's problematic is it's a diverse disease. As you've heard from everyone before, you know, there's different kinds of disease. It affects kids, it affects grown-ups, it's with different types of disorders, Down syndrome, sickle cell, and it maybe is lots of different backgrounds coming together with one common problem. So it's a very difficult thing to get your head around and, and try to research. And so when you when you think about that, one of the things that comes up is how do you study Moya Moya? You know, and, and one thing that I have tried to do in, in my work on this is really try to marry the two sides of research. You know, there's clinical research where people learn from their patients. They try to understand trends of disease presentation, how do you make them better, following up. And these are the things you read about clinical papers and, and all the great stuff you've heard here. And then there's laboratory research where people get very excited and they swizzle test tubes around and beakers explode and all that kind of stuff. Um, and both are really important. I think one of the jobs that, that I have, hopefully, as a neurosurgeon is to try to bridge the gap between the two. We see a lot of doctors, neurologists, uh, clinicians, and they're very excited about certain aspects of Moya Moya, but they don't understand much of what goes on in the laboratory. And then you go over and talk to the scientists, and they are super smart, they have extra lobes in their brain, they're really, really bright folks, but they don't understand the clinical focus of what's important for us to treat, what really affects the kids and grown-ups that have Moya Moya. And I think one of my jobs is to try to bridge the gap between those two and offer a little bit of focus and direction, I hope, in terms of what the areas are that have the best impact to help patients that have Moya Moya. And they really feed off one another. There's a big synergy in what's done. This is just our laboratory and our offices over at the, at the Children's. So in terms of research areas I'm going to talk about today, and, and this is great, I mean, to have a four-hour talk with you right now, I'm really <laughs> <laughs> uh, So I think it's going to be fantastic, so it will be great. Um, but just to sort of overview some of the areas we try to work on and divide into these two camps, uh, from a clinical side, you know, one of the things is a, a database, really a, a very detailed research. Dr. Talk, Dr. Scott talked about sort of the detective work of getting a background on people and being able to learn from that. Um, our operative interventions, what do we do in the operating room? And, and not in a bad way, but we try to use the operating room as a laboratory where we can learn to do better surgeries with our patients and help them. Um, multidisciplinary studies, you know, learning about with all our colleagues, our oncologists, our neurologists, the people who treat, you know, treat kids from genetics with Down syndrome, how can we learn as a collective group to be smarter about taking care of the folks in Moya Moya? And then multi-center collaborations, examples like this, where we get to sit, I mean, to sit down next to Gary Steinberg or Mike Scott and say, hey, what are you doing? What do you think about this? And, and these opportunities are really great. From the laboratory, sort of looking at three big things. 
what causes moya moya, um, how do we detect moya moya early? You heard about the importance of finding out when you have moya moya before you have the bad stroke. You know, getting to treat the surgery, treatment with surgery early, predicting how you're going to do, and then importantly, therapies. How can we get better at treating moya moya by using investigations in the laboratory? And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our work on tailored therapy, trying to design sort of individualized treatment plans for patients, and then augmented angiogenesis, which is spy talk. It sounds really smart, but basically making blood vessels grow better. But it sounds smarter to say augmented angiogenesis. And so these are areas we're trying to work on. I'm just going to kind of go through them one by one and hopefully give you a sense of what we're trying to do with children's and in collaboration with other folks to get things done. Uh, and they do really feed off one another. Uh, a lot of the lines get blurry, and that's what's, I think, important because you don't want something that's just isolated working on yeast genes in a lab with a PhD or just always looking at the same surgery over and over and over again in the offices. You want to say, how can they feed off one another and make exciting things that are new come to light? And so, uh, speaking of new and exciting, I want to start with perhaps the most boring, but probably the most important thing that you can do is uh, getting long-term follow-up, getting good searchable data on your patients. And both uh, Dr. Steinberg and Dr. Scott talked about this. We've now developed a web-based, sort of HIPAA-compliant, uh, appropriately uh, protected uh, database. And with this, we now have people that are uh, entering and collecting long-term data on all our patients. So we're able to get all their various medical history, not just the moya moya history, but all the things people have asked about in this room. Cholesterol levels, history of uh, other uh, issues that have gone in the child, other surgeries they've done. We get a family history. We're able to put together a family tree. And with this, for our genetic studies, which I'll talk about a little bit later, we can put together and say, we together patterns in families that we can all have in one spot. We've got our imaging studies, so we have all the radiology data that's culled and put into one spot so we can correlate, for example, the phenotype, you know, how people look with the genetics of how they are. Um, for me, I'm, uh, as I'll talk about a little later as well, I'm interested in some of the laboratory work. And one of the hard things is always a disconnect. I've gone to so many different people's labs that have done biomarker work, the things I'm interested in. And you ask how they're doing, and they say, well, they have one database in their lab for all their laboratory specimens, and they have another database that the clinicians keep for all their patients, and they're never married. And this is something where I hope we can have everything in one spot, so you can say, all right, well, if you're looking up, uh, you know, Johnny Jones, not to use the word Smith, I'm very sensitive to that, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, you look up patient Smith, uh, and you can say, well, what is their laboratory, you know, experimental stuff they have in the lab? What are those results? And how does that correlate with what they've done with their MRIs and their clinical follow-up? And this is all in one spot. And so this is something I think that's very exciting for us going forward as we start to incorporate all our patients. And those of you who are our patients are going to be getting calls over the summer um, to get sort of long-term follow-up on these patients. So we can really say in one spot we can tie all my laboratory work and all our clinical work together. Um, in addition to that detective work, the other area we're working pretty hard is in the operating room, trying to use the operating room a little bit as a laboratory. You've heard about this from Dr. Steinberg and Dr. Scott, where they're trying to improve the surgery that we've done. Uh, a little while ago, we did a, a study where one of the ICU doctors said, hey, you know what? They've looked at blood flow measurement in trauma patients. What do you think about doing that in Moya Moya? And so there's this uh, called a hemodex monitor. Uh, it's a little catheter you can put in as part of the surgery. Uh, and what it does is it measures the amount of flow that occurs in different parts of the brain. It's important to us to say, well, gee, does blood flow get different in the operating room? Is this something that's at risk uh, for having a stroke during the anesthesia? And what we do is uh, during the surgery, we had a series of these patients where we made a little hole and put this little catheter in, and you can see the little graphic there. And what it allows us to do is say, well, during the surgery and then during the recovery period, the time you've heard are sort of the risky periods, can we predict those folks that are going to be potentially at greater risk of having problems with anesthesia recovery? And so we looked at uh, 25 hemispheres. We monitored basically for the full operation and the day after. And we found there wasn't a lot of big differences overall in terms of blood flow in the surgery and then after. Uh, what was interesting though, if you break them down and you say, well, gee, what are the different groups? And we tried to be smart about saying, well, you know, who has different types of disease? And again, this small number of patients, so they're not, you know, big time data, but if you look at folks that have worse moya moya, they have less blood flow. If you look at people that had old infarcts, uh, for example, uh, they, uh, if they didn't have, a, interestingly, if they did have an infarct in the past, they had more blood flow, which makes you wonder why was that occurring? You know, is this something where around the edge they're trying to get more blood flow? And most importantly, I think, is 
one of the things we get worried about, and uh, this was mentioned by Dr. Scott, is if the blood flow slows during the operation, the EEG slows down. It's a measure that we have to find out that something bad is going on. And what we saw is that in folks that had uh, EEG slowing during the operation with this sort of experimental device, they had lower blood flow. And so what this maybe tells us is we might have a tool by which to help predict which are the folks that are at risk of having something go wrong. We just published a paper just came out this month, you know, another example of these collaborations and using the operating room as an area for research is intraoperative EEG, the ability to monitor real-time brain waves. And our neurology colleagues are great. They're, uh, again, the folks that have sort of extra lobes in their brain. And they come and talk to us about modifying the way we put the electrodes on so we can do our surgery and monitor as much brain as possible, sort of constantly tweaking and improving our ability to manage this. And then our anesthesia colleagues are helpful in terms of figuring out what kind of medicines we can give to protect the brain during the surgery. And so these are some examples of collaborations in the operating room that have come about recently where we're doing research with our patients in real time to figure out how we can make the surgery safer. I think another great example, and this meeting is a, is a super example of this, is looking at multidisciplinary or multi-center studies. Uh, you know, moya moya, as we talked about, is a rare disease. It's not rare in this room, but it's rare around the world. And I think one of the ways we're going to get smarter about understanding this is by pulling together many different types of disciplines. For the kids that have moya moya and sickle cell, talking to the hematologist. There are other things we should be thinking about. The folks that have moya moya and Down syndrome should be talking to the geneticists about collaborations, neurofibromatosis. And then the other thing is when you have limited numbers, be able to sit down next to you know, the Stanford team and say, what are you guys doing for research? And hearing about that, saying, well, gee, can we collaborate on this? What do you think about that? Talking to different groups around the country, you can get power in numbers to really do a lot more as a group than you can as an individual. And these are great examples of that. I got a nice picture uh, of Dr. Scott from Philadelphia here as a young man. You can see the boat tie right here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it was hard getting the photographs. I was in the town library here. I just grabbed this last night when I was putting this together. But, you know, this raises the question, are, are kids different than adults? Are different subgroups of people uh, different? Everyone's talked about this, but the only way we're going to learn this is by collaborating and studying. We've talked about all the different types of diseases, and, and these are just highlighted a few that are sort of uh, areas of interest of mine and, and, uh, and our group at Boston. And uh, you know what we've done is try to look at some of these associations and having the two groups play off one another. Are the folks that are involved in the clinics in the laboratory that do research on these diseases, the neurofibromatosis genetics experts, uh, <coughs> the geneticist Mustafa Sahin, who really is a, a neurologist but does a lot of basic science research to collaborate with us for this. And it's been a big help. And just in the past year or so, you know, we collaborated with a group out of UCSF that 